I'm Jay Horton. I make movies that make money. And this is Filmmakers On. Today, I'm talking to the filmmaker behind the powerful documentary, Wilmington on Fire. Christopher Everett tells us how he made a huge profit theatrically taking his film on the road. I think he's the first filmmaker that I've talked to that has really done this this successfully. You're going to want to watch this one through. Let's do the interview thing. How are you doing today, Chris? Doing well, doing well. How are you? I'm pretty good, man. Doing well. Uh, you, you're starting to get out and about a little bit more now that uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. You know, I was always out and about somewhat during um, during these times of the pandemic. Um, but yeah, I'm getting out a little bit more now. You're, you're primarily a documentary filmmaker. Did you always want to do documentaries? Yeah, man. You know, I've always loved the genre. You know, just even as a kid, my mom would always buy documentaries, you know, especially documentaries on Black history and Black culture. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I always had a, a love for it. And, you know, seeing people like Stanley Nelson and, and Bill Greaves and, you know, guys like that coming up, um, you know, I've always wanted to be like them, you know, and mm -hmm. make those powerful, impactful documentaries. So how, how did you get started? Well, I would say, man, I got started doing documentaries, I would say about 2007. Like, I, I would always take it back to this. Um, years ago, when I was like 100 pounds lighter, I used to, <laughs> I used to do like a lot of modeling and acting, man. Um, I did like a lot of, you know, indie work throughout the South, did a couple of things up, New, up in New York. Mm -hmm. And then I made the move to Atlanta in 2007. And I just kind of got out of it. And then I said, you know what? I still want to get involved in this industry somewhat. Um, let me start making some documentaries. And so my first documentary was called the uh, the Laurenburg Institute established in 1904 and I'm originally from Laurenburg born and raised Laurenburg North Carolina so a little small rural town and so I decided to make that my first documentary project I grew up right around the corner from the school and this school has been around since 1904 my grandfather went to school there it was a historical black boarding and day school mm -hmm. in North Carolina and people like Dizzy Gillespie went to school there a um, whole bunch of former NBA players went to school there over the years. And so I knew the people who actually ran the school. Now it's like third generation of ownership. Mm -hmm. And so I knew the folks who currently own the school. I um, went to church with them. So it was a real tight knit community, but I didn't realize the history of it until I got older. And I said, you know what, let me do this as my first project. I totally bombed it. <laughs> <laughs> it was my first one, man. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I still look through that footage now, man. You know, we shot on the mini DV tapes. Oh, and yeah. I'm actually thinking about going back in and just doing some editing to it and, um, you know, just put it out. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, but uh, that was my first attempt at doing a documentary. And I totally failed. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and that was like from 2007 to like 2010. Right. What, what would you say the um, your major mistakes were on that project? I would say um, not enough planning um, structure wise of really developing a script and an actual story outline mm. um, and, and really sticking to it. And also not having enough funds either. Um, you know, I just kind of came into it like, hey, let's just shoot a whole bunch of stuff um, and try to do the Ken Burns style of just interviews and panning. And, you know, it's, it's more to it than that. And, you know, I learned the hard way. Let's talk a little bit about Wilmington on Fire. How, how, did, how did that come about? Well, Wilmington on Fire, um, that was the project right after my failed uh, Lauren Brick Institute project happened. Uh -huh. And I came up with that concept around 2010. I was still living in Atlanta during the time. And Laurenburg, you know, growing up, Laurenburg is like an hour and a half from Wilmington. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, your audience, if they're familiar with Wilmington, North Carolina, you know, it used to be real big for the film industry. Yep. Um, Screen Gym Studios is there. A lot yeah. of big shows and movies were filmed there over the years. It's starting to come back now. Mm -hmm. But at one time, the 90s, man, you know, that was the, the spot you know, to do films in, in the South and lot, really throughout the country. Yep. And so, you know, knowing this history of the 1898 massacre, the, one of the only coup d'etats that's ever happened in America, um, no one actually did a documentary on it. You know, there were several books about it. I said, you know what, I'm gonna try to do this. I know I failed the first time, <laughs> but let me go back to the drawing board and really um, prepare a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to, you know, again, you know, do a, a, a real story outline, story treatment, figure out who all I wanted to have in this thing, create some type of budget 
and make sure I had that money to get at least get this project going, at least get it to the stage of getting everything shot. Mm -hmm. And so what I did, man, I just built up a crew. Um, and then when I was doing all this stuff, end up getting laid off from my job in Georgia. And so that forced me to move back to North Carolina. And so I just, you know, so pretty much procrastinating because I was doing a lot of that. And I said, you know what, I'm about to move back to North Carolina and really dig into this project. You know, so I moved back to Laurenburg with, at my grandparents' house. And that gave me just that flexibility of going to Wilmington. Like I said, Wilmington is like an hour away from Laurenburg. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to go down there, do a lot of research, meet some cool people, meet some historians, activists, and people like that. And then I started building out a crew, man. I think I went to Craigslist and put like an ad up um, back then. It's like 2010 and found some amazing um, talent. Um, found my DP, Isaiah Dante Lee, um, the guy that does my scoring still to this day, Matthew Head. And these guys have gone on to do some amazing things like Dante um, DPs, a lot of big time shows, a lot of big time movies now. Matthew, he um, scores a lot of big films. He recently scored the, um, the Black Church documentary that was on PBS by Henry Louis Gates. He scored oh, that. Wow. And so we pretty much all kind of came in this together. And this was really our first major project, <laughs> you know, together. And we were all kind of new to this, but we really wanted to tell this important story. And so we all kind of sacrificed, you know, budget, time and everything to really put this thing together. And that's how it kind of came about, man. And it took about three years to get everything shot. I put all my savings into it, mm. did a couple of crowdfunding campaigns to help out here and there. And, you know, we got everything shot. Right. Um, how did you how did you approach it, um, you know, kind of from a technical standpoint, especially, you know, being something that happened so far in the past? You know, most right. documentaries are so wall to wall with, you know, B-roll and, you know, following the events. Like, right. so how, how did you how did you attack that? Well, I would say um, I, I was inspired by a couple of documentaries. Um, one was um, Banished by Marco Williams. He did an docu excellent documentary about three different racial massacres. Um, to what happened in Wilmington. He covers, covers three that happened. I think it was two in Georgia and one in, um, I think, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And so watching that film years ago and seeing him doing how he constructed his film really helped. And also another great um, documentary series um, by Tariq Nasheed, he developed a, a documentary series called Hidden Colors. And this is when the first Hidden Colors came out and he had all these different personalities, all these scholars together um, just giving you back-to-back -back information. It just wasn't a boring spot throughout the film. And I said, you know what? Let me do something similar. Let me get all these brilliant minds in a good mixture. Like, so we have community activists, direct descendants of some of the victims of the massacre, historians, people who actually worked on official state reports for North Carolina, um, and get all these different personalities together like Tariq did and not have a boring um, spot throughout, where it's just nonstop information, um, you know, art laid over with archival footage, um, photos, the whole nine, you know, and then just a very captivating score um, from Matthew as well. And so we were able to put that together. So it was just a combination, man, of looking at, you know, folks like Tariq Nasheed, um, Marco Williams, Banish, and also some of Stanley Nelson's um, um, earlier works as well. And also Ken Burns, you know, of just how he would, you know, work with pacing and things like that. So I just tried to take a little bit of things that I admired in other documentaries that I saw to kind of put this thing together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. I have a little bit of a selfish interest in it. I'm uh, attacking a project right now about the Atlanta Ripper, uh, some yeah. uh, serial killings here in Atlanta cool. uh, back in like turn of the century. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah, we're, we're yeah, talking about yeah, can you post it on that, man? That's, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, for sure. We're going to uh, uh, Philadelphia a uh, week after next to do one of our main interviews. Cool, cool. Yeah. Excellent. W what did you do for distribution on this project? Well, I guess um, before that, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, when I was kind of, you know, telling you about, you know, I got everything shot, but mm -hmm. I totally forgot about post-production. You know, <laughs> my, whole, my main goal was just to get everything shot. And so we actually accomplished that. I said, oh man, I need money for posts. And so what I did was, and this actually leads into the marketing. Okay. Um, what I did was, um, you know, we finished shooting, did a couple of crowdfunding campaigns, 
I was able to tap into certain people like Tariq Nasheed, someone who I admired, who has a huge following. He actually donated to my campaign mm. and he would wear the Wilmington on Fire shirt on his podcast, on his video podcast. And I was able to tap into his audience that he was building. And so that helped down the road. And then so everyone was, it was this anticipation that was building. And I didn't tell no one I didn't have any funds <laughs> post-production. You know, I would just keep hyping it up, you know, and I said, you know what, I'm going to do what I saw a lot of rappers and indie musicians do over the years, where they'll go on the radio and do all this promotion to promote a single, but they knew the album wasn't coming out, you know, so they, but they would always get this hype and build this interest. So I would do the same thing, drop a clip here and there, mm -hmm. do podcasts, do all these different press things just to build that momentum. But doing that actually worked because it actually helped me get um, an investor to come in. Um, and it was an NBA player, David West. Um, he's retired now. Um, he played his last two seasons a few years ago with the Golden State Warriors during their last two championship runs. And he actually saw an interview I did a couple of years prior and was just following the film. And mm. so he reached out to that one media outlet and then they contacted me. They said, hey man, David West reached out to us and he wants to get a DVD of the film. He's been waiting on it. Um, do, you, do you have it ready or do you still need funding? And I said, man, it's not ready, I need some help. And um, he said, well, he might can help you out and let me connect you. And so that's how it happened, man. And that's how we were able to, to get the post-production funds. And wow. so after that happened, he started elevating it even more. He got like a few other NBA players to talk about it promote it um and then we actually premiered the film november 2015 at the kukuloris film festival in wilmington north carolina kukuloris is real big in wilmington in north carolina and so i wanted to really target it there because when it happened there and then kukuloris every year their dates line up with the actual anniversary of the 1898 massacre oh, wow. so it was just perfect for for promotion media and everything i said we have to premiere it there and we actually uh, demanded that we have this screening at Thalian Hall. And one, that's their largest venue, 600 seats. And then also that's where the, um, the perpetrators of the massacre um, gathered first before they actually did the massacre. So I was thinking about all these things of how we can premiere this and get the biggest bang you know, possible. And it happened, man. Um, we actually broke their attendance record with that screening. And we still have the record to this day. It, it was crazy, man. This is my first ever screening. Uh -huh. And um, so I'm thinking like, you know, a couple hundred people at the max. Right. And we go out there, like, I think it. Uh, we actually jammed their ticket system. <laughs> you know, it was crazy, man. Like they never seen nothing like it. The day of the screening, um, two hours before um, they opened the doors, it's a block, man. The line was around the block people waiting and these are the people that couldn't get in this is the um the rush line uh -huh. and so it was like it was like a big concert man of about 400 people on the outside that couldn't get in 600 people packed wow. and um yeah I said man I really have something here and so what I did was you know no one was really reaching out for distribution mm -hmm. and I said you know um this is a grassroots effort to put this thing together and we're going to continue with that and so I took the show on the road and so what I did was just went throughout North Carolina because this was a, a North Carolina story first, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I saw that all those people couldn't get <laughs> to, um, to the festival and people couldn't buy tickets because the system was blocked up and all those people on the outside that couldn't get in. I said, you know what, let me rent, just rent the same theater <laughs> the next month and let me get in, get those other 600 people that, that couldn't attend the festival. And that's what I did. And so ended up making, man, uh, you know, a good amount of change mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, makes go around. Then I did the same thing again in Wilmington again, but this time at the college, University of North Carolina, um, Chapel Hill at Wilmington, UNCW. Mm -hmm. And so I made a deal with them. I said, hey, check this out. I'll give a free screening to your whole school because they have a thousand seater auditorium. And I said, I'll give a free screening to the entire school, whoever wants to come, we could fill up a thousand seats, staff, faculty, students, anyone. But in return, you have to let me get the, this venue that, at that evening, seven o'clock to about 10 for free and I keep the box. And they said, deal. So I <laughs> signed nice. it and we did it, man. And um, so we ended up you know, getting about 800 people for that evening. 
like fifteen dollars a ticket, and it's been on ever since. And so those are the things I was doing um, throughout. And so I would take a little bit of the money that we would make and put it into these other venues. So I went to Durham, North Carolina, Goldsboro, and I went to different places that had a, a, a certain connection to the story. Like Goldsboro, we went there because um, one of the, the, the perpetrators of the 1898 massacre, he was from there. And so there was history of him and stuff like that there. And so we went to these areas that had like these direct correlations um, with the 1898 massacre and ended up packing them out everywhere, man. So like we would go to venues, 300 seaters, 500 seaters and just sell them out. And, you know, we'll have the merch table. And I said, I'm doing this just like a musician. I'm gonna have my merch table. We had the t-shirts, the posters, you know, all that stuff, the DVDs, the whole nine. And a lot of times, man, we would cover the venue just, just with the merch table and mm. just the tickets just be straight profit. <laughs> and so I did that for a full year of doing those screenings around North Carolina, doing some festivals outside of the state, like the Pan-African Film Festival in LA. We won an actual award for that. Mm -hmm. And we did some things in Chicago, New York, and other places throughout the South as well. And so I did that all the way up to the following year. And so I decided to release the documentary that following November and plan it around the 1898 um, massacre anniversary you know, November 10th. And so we built a whole campaign around that leading up. Like we had a, a big pre-order push. Well, we made probably about $10,000, man, just pre-orders alone. Wow. Um, and so we gave people a discount, you know, if you pre-order right before, you know, November 10th. And then November 10th, as soon as that hits, it goes to the regular price. And so we had a lot of interest built up. We also released it simultaneously on Vimeo as well and did very well for a few mm -hmm. months. And um, yeah, man, it's just been on ever since. And so what we still do, and it's been close to six years and we still screen this film to this day. Like I'm constantly, you probably see on my social media, man, I'm constantly doing the virtual screening still, even during the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, because when these certain events that go on in our society, like what happened January 6th, things that happened last year, interest kind of build, continues to build up and people hear about 1898 and then they see my film and they tie the two together and say, hey man, we want you to speak at our school. We want you to speak at our organizations. We want to license the film. So over the past six years, man, I've been doing like a lot of licensing, mm -hmm. um, a lot of speaking engagements. And that's really, <laughs> you know, where the bulk of the income really comes from speaking, licensing. Um, and we're doing okay on Amazon as well too. Yeah, that's great. You know, I, I actually I came upon your movie initially because of uh, um, what was it? The Watchmen. We're talking about the uh, the yeah. Texas massacre. Yeah. And I still, you know, going down the Google rabbit hole and uh, came across this as I and I had I had no clue. Yeah. Like, uh, and like I said, you know, when these type of events happen, like when the Watchmen came out yeah. and then when they're talking about Tulsa, everyone and I would see a spike. <laughs> you know, in my digital sales, man, like I remember when last year um, when uh, when the murder of George Floyd happened and you had a lot of protests going on yeah. um, around the country, um, I saw a huge increase. I think I made like five thousand dollars in one month. Mm -hmm. um, it was crazy. And um, then, you know, then combined with licensing that I would say probably about made about 10 grand in one month. Wow. Yeah, that's really great. And I, re I really like how you kept your, you kept it so specific, especially your initial releases, you know, right. it was very regional, you know, right. you, you don't see that a lot with independent filmmakers, they they try to go for the widest right. birth, and you don't really right. have the, you know, marketing muscle to, to reach exactly. that. And, yeah. Exactly. And that's what I was looking at. I said, man, yeah. I don't have millions of dollars to reach this mass. Let me just stick with my base. You know, let me stick in Wilmington first. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the demand, Wilmington was always my home base. You know, that's where the story is set. And then outside of that base is the rest of North Carolina. And then outside of that, you know, with the more, I guess, scope of things are people that, you know, that want to see social justice, social change as well. So I just kind of went to those different levels, you know, and increased it and kept increasing it. So I said, you know, let me start at the home base first, Wilmington, and, and just kept moving from there. The, the film has had a huge impact um, throughout Wilmington. And I didn't realize it until last year during um, the whole protest when the protest movements were going on around the country and people were saying, man, your film really, really changed my life. It really opened my eyes and really 
made me want to get more involved in the community. I know even we're filming Wilmington on Fire Chapter Two right now. One guy who we've been filming and documenting, he owns a big tech company, one of the co-founders of this big tech company in Wilmington. And he reached out a couple of years ago and wanted to help me as well. He kind of helped me with the startup funds for Wilmington on Fire Two before Hillary you know, got involved. And um, because he said, man, your film really, really changed my life, man. It's made me want to get out in the community and do some things. And I was like, wow, I didn't know, <laughs> you know, I didn't know the film, you know, was, was going to do that, you know. And um, so he's been doing a lot of things now, um, helping out a, a lot of, you know, a lot of good programs and initiatives throughout the city of Wilmington. So you're starting to see that. You're starting to see other corporations and companies um, show the film and, and creating dialogue and conversation around it. And so the film is doing a lot that I could only, you know, I, I would never, I never thought in a million years that the film would have that impact and still having that impact. Then a couple of years ago, we actually got mentioned, we were the only film that was mentioned a few years ago when they had the big congressional hearing on reparations in DC mm -hmm. a couple of summers ago. And so I knew that they were going to have it, but I didn't know I was going to get shout, get a shout out, <laughs> you know, on, on the world stage because you know everyone around the world was showing this. It was on CNN, CBS, everything. Mm -hmm. And so Julianne Malvo, she was on there giving a presentation about reparations, and she actually saw the film some months earlier and, and loved it. And so she was doing her presentation and talked about Wilmington, and urged everyone to watch Wilmington on Fire. <laughs> so well, she's like, Wilmington on Fire, watch Wilmington on Fire. It's an excellent documentary on this. Man, and I was I was at home on my lunch break, you know, and just listening. And I get everyone that I knew on social media just tagged me. Uh-huh. Just hitting me up. Um, DVD orders just went out the roof. Everyone was ordering on Vimeo and Amazon. It was crazy, man. And everyone was tagging me and say, hey man, we just saw you get a shout out. And I said, yeah, that's cool. I didn't expect that, <laughs> you know? So those are some of the things that have happened, man, um, you know, with this project. And it's been all independent, you know, it's all been us, you know, self-distribution, all independent and everything. Man, and that's got to feel incredible because I, I, I've talked, I, you know, I've, I've talked about this before about the power of making documentary film. And yeah. so, you know, I've been doing narratives for, you know, 20 years. I just started working on docs a few years ago. And but that there is, you know, I, and nothing against narrative films, man. It's right. a great creative expression and right. you can make positive change with them. I'm not saying you can't. Right. But documentary film is a, like it's a whole different thing. Like you can it touch is. and inform people on a whole different level. Right. And then also, yeah, you know, with narrative, a lot of times, you know, you especially to, to get the distribution that you want, you have to have some type of name a lot of times. But right. with documentary, you know, you don't need the name. The, the name really is the story. You know, what's the story and what's right. that story you're trying to tell on, on screen? You know, and that's what's really most important. And people just love documentaries. They love these stories and they love to, to connect with them as well. Okay. Um, so what, what did, what, what happened? Uh, what did you do after that? Well, I got a couple of things, man. Um, you know, one, you know, we still screening <laughs> for me to no fire, We actually got a virtual, a couple of virtual events over the next couple of weeks, next week, starting next week. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess you can take it back to last year. Um, or I would say a couple of years after Wilmington on fire, you know, I was able to help produce a couple other projects, um, because someone helped me. You know, mm -hmm. um, my mentor, um, a guy by the name of Pete Chapman, um, he directs a lot of big time TV shows now, um, but I was a fan of him coming up. Um, he did an excellent indie film back in the day called Premium with uh, Zoe Saldana, Hill Harper, Dorian Missick, and then he did another great documentary, uh, which I really love as well. And it inspired me to actually have that hip hop track at the beginning mm -hmm. of my film. Um, I saw him do that with his documentary on the 761st Black Tank Battalion in World War II, where he starts off the, um, he has Colin Powell giving a little, um, you know, segment to intro. And I said, you know what, this is cool. And I, you see those similarities in my film where I had Faye Chaplin make a little um, segment at the first and then he transitioned to the opening credits with this hip hop track over it. And Pete did the same thing where he has Colin Powell starting it off and then it fades and then the opening sequence starts and it plays um, most deaths, um, Umi says, you know, throughout 
I, I just thought that was so cool, you know, and yeah. just sets the tone. And so I kind of stole that a little bit, <laughs> you know, from him. Yeah. Um, but he, um, but he, he, um, he was the first person I reached out when I was putting this project together years ago. And I was a fan and he was teaching at NYU at the time, film. And because he didn't, um, he had kind of, you know, chilled from film for a while and just focusing on teaching film. And I reached out, I emailed him. I said, man, I really admire your work. I love your documentary on the 761st Battalion. Um, would you mind just being my executive producer? You know, you don't have to do much. You know, just I'll send you some footage here and there. Just give me some feedback. That's it. I won't bother you. You know, no more. And he said, he hit me up a week later. He said, sure, man, send me, send me your stuff, man. Let's, let's talk about it. Let's talk on the phone. And we just connected, man. And he was, you know, there for me the whole process. And then a few years ago, he ended up moving to L.A., does a lot of big time TV shows now. He actually, um, his, he got married a few years ago. Um, what's the lady that's on Grey's Anatomy? Um, Kelly McCreary. You know, they uh, recently got married. Yeah, so Pete is doing his thing out in Hollywood right now, but he was one of those guys that were there for me, you know, early on, you know, and it believed in me when no one else did. And I was just this guy from a small town in North Carolina. And it showed, and I also tell filmmakers that, that really you can utilize the internet but it's also about timing as well. Like if I would reach out to Pete now, he probably would ignore my email. <laughs> but right. at that time, you know, he was just teaching and he had that open time and freedom to to want to get to want to get involved and help me out at the process. So I said, you know what? I want to do the same thing. You know, if someone comes to me and I have the time and they're really working hard at their project cuz we've all been there and we all just need that that extra help and push. And yeah. so this one young guy um Ricky Kelly he came to one of my screenings when I was touring Wilmington on Fire. Mm -hmm. And he had an excellent project called Black Beach, White Beach, A Tale of Two Beaches. And anybody that's familiar with the Carolinas, everyone knows about Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and Black Bike Week that happens every Memorial weekend. You know, it's big. And people come, bikers come from all over the country, man, and just party all week, riding bikes. It's a huge thing. And so Laurenburg is like an hour and a half from Myrtle Beach as well. So we would always go down there. So I was like, man, I, I want to get involved in this, you know, because it's right up my alley. But the way he did it was he wanted to give it some historical context as well. And I didn't even know, you know, why, you know, how Black Bike Week started, you know, the history behind it. And that's what caught my attention. I was like, okay, he's adding a, another layer to this. You know, it's not all this about partying and bikes and, and girls, <laughs> but it's more to it than that. And also how you know African Americans started this, and this was a, a Black Beach area for, for, since segregation, and how they really want to reclaim it back. Mm -hmm. I say I have to get involved in this, and so you know I became his mentor and became his executive producer, and he ended up getting a distribution deal as well. And he finished the film, we got it done, and it's been out for a couple of years now. It's on um, BET Plus, it's on IMB TV. He's doing his thing, and he's working on his next project right now. So. Doing those type of things, you know, while Wilmington on Fire was out, you know, really meant a lot to me to help someone else um, accomplish their dreams and goals to help them get to the next level. And then right after that, I started my next documentary, <laughs> which I'm currently filming right now. It's a martial arts project called Grand Master, the Vic, the Vic Moore story. And um, so how I did this was I used to take karate growing up mm -hmm. and my old teacher, you know, he heard about what I was doing with Wilmington on Fire. So I'm down in Laurenburg visiting my family and running to my old karate teacher. And he said, man, I see you doing your thing, you know, with Wilmington on Fire. You ever thought about doing something about Grandmaster Vic Moore? He's my teacher. I said, oh man, I never heard about him. And so he sent me some things. And so I read up on him. I said, man, uh, why I never heard about this guy? And he's here in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, he's been here in North Carolina since the seventies. And so I said, well, connect us. And that's how it happened. And, you know, so I wanted to do that because I've always been a huge martial arts person, you know, grew up, you know, on that genre of movies and everything um, outside of documentary, you know, action film really was what I wanted to do as well. Yeah. And so the chance of com combining both of those was was amazing. It was exciting. And so that's what I started on next was getting that together, um, planning it all together. And then we started shooting. So we've been shooting for about three years. We'll be done shooting everything by September. Wow. Uh, we would have already been done, but COVID messed us up last year. So yeah. we had to wait. But Grandmaster um, is about Vic Moore, martial arts pioneer from the 1960s, four-time world karate champion, 
Um, he was really um, one of those pioneers when karate first became a professional sport in the 60s. And he was a part of Robert Trias's organization, the USKA, ended up working his way up through there and becoming um, one of his chief instructors. And, you know, Robert Trias is kind of considered, you know, one of the fathers of American karate. You know, I think he opened up one of the first karate schools in the United States in Arizona, I think the late 40s, early 50s. And so he worked his way up through there and became one of his chief instructors. And um, he's still teaching, you know, to this day. And so we've been documenting him and these two young guys as well that he's really taken under his wing. Uh, one guy is a, is a two-time world karate champion in his own right, uh, Wayne Easterland. And mm -hmm. we've documented his experience over a couple of years, went to some big tournaments. I know one tournament we filmed, we went down to Miami a couple of years ago. It was cool, man. He was the defending champion. And so I think our cameras made him nervous because he ended up losing in the first round. Oh. <laughs> so, so we didn't expect that. You know, he had won the previous year and said, man, we got to go down there. I know he's going to win this. Then we have a back-to-back -back title. But he ended up losing. But it was good for the film because in life, it just goes shows those life principles, man. You don't always win. It's just how you bounce back from that defeat sometimes. And that's what the film is about. You know, it's really showing yeah. those valuable life lessons that the martial arts, you know, can can teach you and have on your life. And then the other character that we've been filming is a young man by the name of Stuart Gumby. Um, he's a little challenged, um, you know, mentally challenged, but karate has changed his whole life for the better. And Grandmaster Moore has become like a father figure to him. And, you know, we were there when he first got his um, first black belt. Um, and, you know, Grandmaster Moore is tough. He's from that old school of karate. And a lot of people quit and can't take the, uh, the rigorous training uh, methods of Grandmaster Vic Moore. And Stewart, he still sticks with it. And it's done mm -hmm. a lot. We were there filming him at his job. He's like one of the top workers at his job now. He has confidence. Um, and he's winning tournaments. We were there, some of his tournament wins. Um, and it's really, man, to show the power of what martial arts can do for the human spirit and body. And wow. so I'm excited about this project. And um, it's great. And I also recently got selected for Firelight Media's um, documentary lab for the project mm -hmm. as well. You know, Firelight is by um, Stanley um, Nelson. You know, it's his organization. And every year they select like 12 documentary makers. Um, and I was selected. I didn't think I was going to get selected. I just applied and said, what the hell? <laughs> and, um, ended up being selected. They love the project. They love my work sample and what I was trying to do with it and ended up getting selected. So I've been doing that um, right. documentary lab since January. For, for people that don't know, like what, what is a documentary lab? What goes into that? Well, a documentary lab um, is where, you know, it's a lot of mentorship, um, a lot of, so it's 12 of us. And we have these group sessions where we watch, you know, footage, you know, from each project, give critique, honest critique and feedback. Um, we also, they also have other industry professionals that come to the table and show um, snippets and some of their work. Like, so they'll have someone that focuses on, on cinematography, somebody focuses on editing, someone that focuses on archival material and how to use and incorporate archival materials in your documentary. Um, someone that might does music and composition, you know, how to use the score throughout and sound throughout your film. So you'll get these different experts also to add their perspective and have you thinking about things that you never thought, thought about as well. Um, because even with my documentary, I, I really didn't know like, okay, should I do more of a verite style with Grandmaster and actually show the piece more verite style and, and they all agreed. You know, I was, I was very hesitant. I wasn't confident at all of doing it in that way. And, but showing them the piece, they all loved it. They just say, hey, just incorporate a little bit more archival to it. And we think you got something here. And so it gives you a chance to really experiment and get that feedback where you don't have, you might not have that confidence um, yourself. And then being around your peers and other industry professionals to really have a second, second or third eye to it. A lot of times we're looking at it the whole time and you're like, oh, I don't know. Yep. <laughs> but see, having someone else see it and especially industry people who have done like a Stanley Nelson, who I consider a legend mm -hmm. and having him critique and giving the feedback and, you know, what's working, what's not working. And then also looking at other people's work. And, you know, we, we're always constantly um, meeting each other on Zoom, bouncing ideas. You know, I might have an idea for one lab person, send it to them and vice versa. And so th these, these labs are real cool, man. It's, it's, and it's also develop, developing a network 
So we have these email databases, like if someone's looking for an editor or a DP or entertainment lawyer, you know, we'll send it out like a mass email chain and say, hey, anybody know someone in this area? And we all kind of look out for each other. So that's another thing that these labs do is create this, um, this community of other doc makers as well. That's incredible. That's great. Um, I know that your so your day job, you work for the Full Frame Documentary Film Festival. So yeah. how important do you think film festivals are today for filmmakers? It depends. You know, like uh, Full Frame is, is a great film festival. Um, I've been there, had the pleasure of being there for three years. I'm the communications manager there. So I'm usually, I'm over like all the social media graphic design, outreach, promotion, stuff like that. Um, film festivals are cool. You know, um, it really depends because a lot of people, you know, I've even seen it at full frame where, where filmmakers get mad if they don't get accepted. Because, you know, full frame is big. You know, it's a big deal. I didn't realize it was a big deal until I started working there. Mm. That um, it's huge, you know, in the documentary community. And so a lot of times filmmakers get upset if their film doesn't get selected. But I tell filmmakers all the time, I say, look, I work at a festival, it's not the end of the world, all right? Because there's different factors that go in, you know, our programming team has a certain, you know, thing they're trying to craft, you know, and that's how it is with a lot of festivals. And I tell filmmakers all the time that if you don't get into a festival, it's cool. There are other festivals out there, one. And then also, I always looked at it like this, like why do a festival all the time where if you build your own audience and go right to your audience, you can get that 10 or $20,000, <laughs> you know? And that's how I looked at it even after I premiered at Cooper Loris. Mm -hmm. And I saw that, I said, hold on, man, these guys just made about 20 grand off my film. And I already had the audience. And that's why I said, you know what, let me just rent the same venue they had. You know, the venue ain't nothing like, I think 800 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, you know, let me just rent the venue. I got the, the audiences here. And that's what we did. We ended up packing the same thing again. And so I try to tell filmmakers, yes, submit to festivals, because I still do. You know, I love going to festivals. I'm glad things are opening back up. You know, I just love being around other talented filmmakers and networking. You know, they're great for that. And also, it's great to see other people's work, And because I'm always trying to learn and get better. And so working at Full Frame has really helped me as a filmmaker, just seeing the quality of documentaries. And it's just helped me step my game up a lot. And so festivals can, can be that. And I think filmmakers have to start looking at it like that, saying, hey, let me get what I can get out of it. Right. Whether I get accepted or not, you know, hey, I have to, you have to get better. You have to step your game up. It's always about getting better. Even I look at like Kobe Bryant. He was constantly working every day. Michael Jordan constantly worked every day when they were playing basketball, even though they were the greatest at their profession. Every day they still worked hard at it. And I try to do the same thing. And I think filmmakers have to do the same thing. You know, it's so <laughs> overall, what I'm trying to say is film festivals are great. Um, I think they're a great avenue for promotion, especially of promoting and hyping up your project and building that camaraderie. Um, and like I said, man, with, there's nothing like it. Um, this area just loves documentary. Um, anytime we um, have the festival, man, we bring in about 20 to 30,000 people over the course of a four day, four day week. And um, so we're, we're gearing up right now uh, for the virtual festival. Um, it's gonna be June 2nd through the 6th. So another project, cause we're actually, I'm actually doing two documentaries at once right now, which is crazy. Yeah. And I'll never do that again, <laughs> but it, it happened um, kinda, kinda crazy, man. Um, we're working on Wilmington on Fire chapter two. Oh, nice. Um, I'll be, yeah, I'll be done with that at the end of June. We got seven days left and we're gonna use those last seven days of June mm -hmm. to finish it. And how I came about with Wilmington on Fire Chapter 2, I always wanted to do a follow-up to the first one. But the first one was just continuously, it was doing well, just right. didn't have the time <laughs> to, to, to do it. And so then, you know, I wanted to do something different with Grand Masters Project. And so I got to do that. And then last year, um, during the whole um, um, protest movements that was going on throughout the country, and there was a big protest movement in Wilmington, um, started by a group of folks that I knew um, anyway, just being in Wilmington a lot and just developing these relationships over the years. And I said, you know what? Um, I think this, this is it. Let me go ahead and go down there and start filming and let's see what happens.
And so I did that. We just started filming and documenting a lot of the protest activity that was going on. And then um, started talking to a few other people as well. And I said, you know what, this is the story we want. Let's show Wilmington today and how this community is coming together to mm. really change um, these effects of the 1898 massacre, to really put everything in perspective. And so also, so when I started doing that, um, you know, a lot of people were talking about moving a lot of the Confederate monuments and statues as well throughout the country, and especially in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of celebrities that have been in Wilmington over the years, whether it's TV or movies, started to be real vocal about that, and especially in Wilmington. And so uh, one lady, um, Hillary Burton Morgan, who's an actress, she's married to Jeffrey Dean Morgan um, of The Walking Dead, yeah, yeah. Plays Negan in The Walking Dead. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She um she used to uh, work on One Tree Hill. She used to be an actress on One Tree Hill. One Tree Hill was shot in Wilmington over the years. And so she was in Wilmington for about 10 years during that time. And so Wilmington always had a special place in her heart. And so she was get on social media, really promote the removal of these monuments. And so someone told her about Wilmington on fire. And so she watched it and gave me a shout out on her Instagram. She has millions of followers. And so I'm on my Instagram and saw about 300 people started following me. I was like, man, well, there's people following me. <laughs> I scroll down. I said, why is Hillary Burton uh, Morgan tagging me? <laughs> and, so, and so I went to the video and I hit her up on, on Instagram. I said, hey, thank you for the support. I really appreciate it. And she's like, oh, wow, you hit me up. I said, yeah, thank you. I just want to give you a shout out. And so we exchanged info. And so I told her what I was doing. You know, I had a couple of virtual events happening. And so she got me on her IG um, talk thing. We did that and hyped it up. Had a huge, hit huge numbers for that, huge views. And she said, Chris, I like what you're doing. I want to continue to help promote Wilmington on Fire. And I see you're doing Wilmington on Fire too. And I want to be a producer on this thing. I want to help you. Wow. And so she, her, yeah, man. So, um, She's attached, man, to, to, to executive produce. And so we've been rolling. I've been filming since last year, and we're going to wrap up um, next month. And so her and her husband, has been, they've been real supportive. And so when I launched a crowdfunding campaign last year to get some other things rolling, um, they supported. Um, she got her um, audience involved. They all poured, you know, contributions in. Also, um, Peyton Reed who's um, the director behind the Ant-Man movies. Yeah. He actually contributed <laughs> to my campaign as well because wow. I didn't realize that um, that he was from North Carolina. I didn't realize he was from Raleigh and he also went to UNC Chapel Hill. And so he was kind of familiar with the story and he wanted to, to help. And also my boy, Pete Chapman, like I was telling you earlier, um, I think he actually met with him to actually possibly direct the TV show he was producing. Mm. And he had watched Wilmington on Fire. He saw Pete's name in the executive producer credits. And he was like, oh man, I just watched that film. I didn't know he was involved in that. And Pete, re Pete reached out to me. He said, yeah, man, he loved the film. I said, hey, that's great, man. So it's like, you never know who's watching and you never know who has that connection to the story. Right. You know, cause a lot of, you know, I didn't realize that a lot of people had a connection to Wilmington or to North Carolina. And like I said, this is a Wilmington and North Carolina story. And so last year when all this stuff was going on, you know, people started really paying attention to the film and, and what the film was about and showed their support as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a really cool story, man. And, you know, uh, one thing that pops to my mind, too, you know, especially talking about how you reached out to Pete initially is like, you know, you never you you're going to you're going to miss all the shots you don't take, yeah. you know. Like yeah, you had no idea if he was going to get back with yeah. you or if it was, you know, but you just you you did it. You reached out in a genuine way. And yeah. yeah. That's yeah, and that's how it is, man. Like I said, you know, Kobe Bryant was one of my favorite basketball players. And I think he, one of his quotes, I think he said, uh, I'd rather go 0 for, what did he say, 0 for 99 than 0 for 9. He said, mm. because if I go 0 for 9, that means I just, I just stopped trying. You know, I just quit shooting and just gave up. He said, but I know if I go 0 for 99, I, I gave it everything. <laughs> so, you know, um, Sometimes that logic is good. Sometimes it isn't. <laughs> but, right. um, but yeah, that's that's the mentality I try to go with, man. I try to give it give it my all. And just being from that small rural town really helped me out a lot, man. And I look back at it now. You know, I moved to Atlanta in 2007. I was like, yeah, you know, I'm moving to Atlanta, this big place. I couldn't get nothing accomplished <laughs> with my film stuff. 
Right. And it wasn't until I moved back to Lombard and back to North Carolina into a smaller environment where I can actually focus and really hone on everything is when I develop some, some amazing things. So I tell filmmakers that all the time too. You know, a lot of times filmmakers want to move to New York or LA. Yeah. So you don't have to. You don't have to, honestly. You can really make it happen, you know, where you're at. Yeah. Yeah. And it's usually, I, I, I found it's been easier yeah. equipment wise. It's cheaper. Yep. There are good people all around the country that you can hire that are, you know, within an hour yep. or two of you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And I then agree. you can, and you can like, like, uh, you know, I just talked about it, man, how I was able to attract a lot of people um, with the internet, like Hillary and all these other people to get involved, man. And, you know, 20, 30, about 30 years ago, I probably would have never been able to connect with these folks because the internet wasn't around. So the internet really opens those doors and opportunities where you don't have to go um, directly and stay in New York or LA and possibly happen to run into somebody, you know, right. <laughs> you know, like, if you just do the work and do it quality and really get it out there, you know, they'll find you and trust me, they will find you because these folks found me somehow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, but uh, I'm just, I'm just loving the support, man. And uh, next year we're going to have two films out and I can't wait to get them out. Yeah, man. I can't wait to see them, dude. When, uh, when you have a release, you have to come back on and talk some more about them. Definitely, definitely, we'll do. Awesome, and and Chris, if people want to uh, like catch up with you or check out your stuff, where's a good place for them to to look? Yeah, you? yeah, um, spellerstreet.com, spellerstreet.com. If you're digging my stuff here, there are a few things you can do to help support it. Hit the like button; it does help. Leave a comment, even if it's just to say what's up. And last but not least. Share these videos, share them on social media, share them on the Facebooks, the Twitters, take a screenshot, share it on Instagram. It would mean a lot to me. But whatever you do, keep making movies.